And there's a participant counter in the bottom of the screen as we see people come on. For those of you that are getting on, we're going to give everyone a, a couple of minutes here to get on before we get started. So take your time settling in. Um, as everyone is getting on, bear in mind this is Zoom webinar, which means that we cannot see you or we cannot hear you. I'll explain a little bit about how to use the question and answer feature uh, in the introduction. But for right now, we're going to hang out for a couple of minutes as I see our participant number creeping up on the bottom of my screen, and then we will get started. I promise to have everyone uh, out of here promptly by 8 p.m. to get to whatever fun you have going on this evening. Maybe one of the few hours that you have during the day to do something outside where it's not ridiculously hot, depending on where you're at. Again, we're just going to give people a couple minutes to get on here. All right, well, it looks like our, our participant count on the bottom of the screen is steady. Uh, so with that said, we'll get started. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to the second of our three webinars from the School of Kinesiology at University of Michigan on COVID-19 and Allied Health and Fitness. Uh, my name is Mike Stack. I am the CEO of Applied Fitness Solutions. I'm also a clinical instructor in the School of Kinesiology. I'm gonna be moderating the panel tonight. And tonight we're gonna to be talking about the return to gyms, fitness centers, and physical therapy clinics and the reopening of these facilities. And this is gonna be a great conversation because we're gonna essentially try to speak to two distinct populations. One, the professionals that are working in the settings and the things that we need to know to ensure we keep our clients, our members and our patients safe and enjoying their experience. And then to those of you that are actually just members of the general public that are wondering, should I go back to the gym? Should I go back into my physical therapy clinic? What's the risk assessment that you need to do to determine if that's a good decision for you and the people that you're closest with? And to have this discussion, we brought in a great group of diverse panelists that I quickly want to introduce. Uh, first, I'll introduce Claire Coates. Claire is an athletic trainer at University of Michigan Athletics. She's going to bring the kind of the sport aspect of this discussion. Uh, Dr. Ryan Malosh is a research scientist at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. He actually specializes in respiratory infectious diseases. Uh, Christian Schwehofer is an environmental health director with the Washtenaw County Health Department. Uh, both Ryan and Kristen have actually been incredibly helpful to my organization in planning some of our reopening guidelines. Uh, David Fletch is the director of Hancock Health and Wellness Center in Indiana. Uh, he is also the chairman elect for the MFA uh, Board of Directors. The MFA is the Medical Fitness Association. They're a, kind of a governing organization that provides protocols and best practices to medical fitness centers. And last but certainly not least is Dr. Corey Snyder. He's a PT manager at Michigan Medicine's MedSport. And I really want to thank all of you guys for joining us. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have a really diverse panel that's going to be able to speak to various aspects of getting back into our gyms, our fitness centers, and our PT clinics, and how to do that in the safest and most beneficial way. A couple of housekeeping notes to start. First and foremost, we're going to be recording this webinar. Uh, it'll be archived on the School of Kinesiology's YouTube page. All of the attendees will be getting an email afterwards uh, that will have that link. We're also going to send some additional resources in that email. Uh, David and the MFA have been kind enough to provide us with some really, really helpful resources. So be on the lookout for that. The other thing is we do have a series of predetermined questions that I'm going to be asking our panelists. All of you have the ability to ask questions through the Q&A feature that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to ask any question that you'd like to. We'll do our best to answer all the questions we can here during the webinar. But bear in mind, we have five panelists and this is a pretty diverse topic that we're going to talk about. We may not be able to get to all the questions during the webinar, uh, but we will do our best to ensure that those questions are answered after the fact and sent to you. I'll have the ability to either answer questions myself or farm those questions out to panelists as appropriate. 
Uh, with that said, I'd like to get started because we definitely want to hear what our panel of experts have to say. And we're going to start with kind of a basic understanding of COVID-19 and exercise and where, where the real concerns lie. And I'm going to rely on Ryan and Kristen, our, our public health experts here, to talk a little bit about this. So, uh, Kristen, why don't we start with you? Give us a basic understanding of the virology associated with COVID-19 and why this potentially poses a problem for exercise settings like physical therapy clinics, gyms, and fitness centers. Sure. So COVID-19 is a virus, uh, as you mentioned, and it's um, mostly classified as a respiratory virus uh, that's spread by droplet spread. There's certainly some question of whether it may also have some airborne components, but we don't have a lot of hard data on that just yet. Um, and that basically means that when we breathe or respire, we are uh, potentially breathing out viral particles. And so those who are near us will uh, potentially be exposed if we have that virus and we're breathing it out. Um, simply saying that when we're exercising, we're breathing harder, which means we're not only um, respiring more, but we are also having maybe more force behind that respiration. And so that could also make those viral tra uh, particles travel a little further. So in an exercise setting, you've got the higher risk and higher potential to um, spread virus, especially this one where we know that not everyone who is um, who has the virus shows signs and symptoms. Um, and that we know that people who can transmit the virus uh, can do so actually before they're showing signs and symptoms. So they're asymptomatic or without symptoms. Right. Ryan, uh, what else do you have to add in terms of the, the virology here and exercising? Yeah, so I think, you know, Kristen really nailed a lot of the, the major points there. I think the things that we, we think about when we talk about transmission of the virus that causes COVID-19, um, <clears throat> we've noticed a lot that indoor confined spaces where there's large groups of people tend to be the places where it spreads most easily. And this is some of the evidence that demonstrates to us as epidemiologists that, um, that the virus is probably most likely spread by, by close contacts and respiratory droplets. Um, and so, you know, play, the things that you see when like outbreaks in prisons, high household secondary attack rates, um, you know, outbreaks in nursing homes, things like that, all of those give us a clue that being in a confined space with a lot of other people is really a risky behavior for this virus. Right, right, yeah, thank you both. And I think that's the, the challenge is, as we think about our, our gyms and our fitness centers, particularly, you know, in the, we don't have anyone here who's really in the boutique fitness industry, the, the Orange Theories and the Fit Body Bootcamp, some of these smaller places, but these are very small footprint places, low ceilings, uh, ventilation can be a challenge. And, and I think that, you know, the industry's just trying to quickly adapt as much as they possibly can. Uh, with that said, um, and I, we'll kick it to Ryan first and then go Kristen second here. Talk about some of the, the evidence-based guidance for reducing exposure and risk of virus transmission. And I guess in saying that, it, it's pretty clear that there's no way you can prevent it entirely, but how do we reduce the likelihood of transmissibility? Yeah, that's right. So, um, and I'll, I'll kind of echo another thing that Kristen said, which is that a lot of what we're learning about this virus is coming at sort of breakneck pace here. And so um, we don't know everything by any stretch of the imagination. And so we have to look at other respiratory viruses to sort of guide us. And there are other coronaviruses that circulate seasonally um, and cause much more mild illness that can give us some clues as well. Um, but what we do know is that, you know, these respiratory droplets, they tend to settle out of the air after about six feet or so. Um, that's an average, it's not sort of the minimum or the maximum, it's something that, it's not a magic number, but it is a, a, a good guide for about how far apart you wanna be from other people, um, further if you can, but, but six feet would be sort of, um, you know, as far, it would be the closest that you would wanna be. Um, and then things like wearing masks, um, especially if you are um, potentially infectious, even if you don't have symptoms, wearing a mask can reduce the amount of virus that you're putting out into the environment. Um, you know, but and masks can also protect people. Uh, there's some limited evidence that masks can protect people who are, who are healthy as well. And then I think one of the major things is just simply staying home if you're not feeling, feeling well, or if you've been around somebody who's not feeling well, and you might potentially be infectious. 
um, just removing yourself from, from exposing other people is one of the best ways that we can go about it. And then the last thing I want to say is that the, none of these interventions is going to be perfect. Not, these are called non-pharmaceutical interventions that we have available to us right now. None of them are perfect at preventing or eliminating the risk of, uh, of infection. And so what you want to do is kind of try to stack those up one on top of each other as much as you can. Um, and that can mean an actual meaning, meaningful reduction in your risk, even if none of them are perfect. Yeah, that's great, Ryan. Thank you. And we're, we're going to get really practical in a hurry here, talking to David, Corey, and Claire about what we're actually doing in the various environments that are informed by public health officials and epidemiologists like Ryan and Kristen. But Kristen, let me throw it to you. What do you have to add? And I guess I want to start my question by saying, Ryan mentioned masks. And I think you know masks are something that are highly, highly effective. And I think the science is very clear on that at this point. But you start to hear masks and exercise and people start to go, mm, I don't know if I'm down with wearing a mask and exercise. So maybe start with that. And then if there's anything else you can add to what Ryan said, that'd be great. Sure. Well, I mean, I think Ryan brought up a really good point, right? You want to stack as many of these prevention mechanisms um, that you can in place, right? So none of them are 100% perfect, um, other than if you were to stay home and not see anyone. Um, but that's really difficult, right? In a, in a real world environment, we all have to get groceries and go to work and, and do some other things. So um, if you can't, you know, stay home, then wearing a mask. And again, I realize it, when you're exercising, that may be very difficult. Um, but there's um, evidence, again, as Ryan had said, that the mask is going to both protect uh, the wearer from potential illness coming in, as well as definitely uh, there's better evidence of making sure that we're not accidentally spreading this virus uh, when we're feeling okay. So we do recommend wearing masks um, whenever possible and practical. Now, I realize that in an exercise setting, that may not always be possible or practical. So you want to do a lot of those other good mechanisms. Um, which is, you know, monitor yourself for symptoms, right? How are you feeling? Do you feel like you might have a fever? Are you feeling run down or a little different than you normally do? Um, COVID has some interesting, a long list of signs and symptoms, but some of the more um, unique ones are include uh, loss of taste or smell. And so again, if, if that's something that you've noticed or are feeling a little bit off about, then that's something to definitely get checked out. Um, and it, including the physical distancing, the mask wearing, um, good personal hygiene. Um, you know, I would say make sure you know where your hands are and where they've been. Um, while we don't think that hand transmission to like your, your mouth, your nose, or your eyes are the main way that this virus spreads, uh, we in public health always appreciate good hand washing. And so this is no exception. Um, so again, really making sure that you're practicing excellent hand hygiene, um, cleaning, again, surfaces, high touch surfaces are, is another great way to help protect yourself and your environment. Um, and then any way you can increase ventilation, right? So if the virus is in the air, increasing ventilation is going to reduce your risk. Maybe not eliminate it, but again, we're talking about a reduction in risk. So doing things outside is less risky than doing things inside. Doing things in a large environment is less risky than doing things in a small enclosed environment. Yeah, that's great. So in, in some sense, it is looking at the physical envelope of the building that people are in and saying, hey, is, how big is this space? How well ventilated is this space? Uh, one thing with regard to masks, and you know, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in epidemiology or public health, but my background is in exercise physiology. And I think one thing we don't give the body enough credit for is its ability to adapt. The first time you work out in a mask, it's not going to be very comfortable just like the first time, you know, maybe you work out in a new pair of tennis shoes, but eventually your body will adapt and will build up some degree of a tolerance. But I mean, it is a very interesting decision, particularly when exercising at higher intensities and heavy respiration rates. Um, Kristen Ryan, thank you for that. And if you guys who are watching have further questions on some of the more in-depth mechanisms of this, we're more than happy to answer those. But my goal is to get very practical for all of you really, really quick and actually start to talk about some of the strategies that are being employed on the front lines of fitness and of PT clinics. And, and I want to start with Claire and we'll look at what's kind of happening in, in the athlete world at a place like University of Michigan and kind of how this can propagate into high school settings and other clubs and gyms. What, a, what are you guys doing in, in U of M athletics to be able to 
kind of you in, be informed by what people like Kristen and Ryan are saying and then actually you know, mitigate the spread as much as you can. Absolutely. Um, thanks for having me and um, thanks for the question. I uh, understand that my supervisor, who's Daryl Conway, he's Senior Associate Athletic Director for Student Athlete Health and Welfare. Um, he and I guess the rest of us have benefited directly by being in a wonderful place like the University of Michigan, where we get to work with the Washtenaw County Health Department, the School of Public Health, um, speaking with the Chief Medical Officer of University of Michigan Medicine, um, in addition to our own team physicians and collaborating with a bunch of people from the governor's office on down to do what we can to make the best decisions for our student athletes to ensure that they have a safe return to play. Um, right now, what that has looked like, at least since early June, um, starting with our football and basketball programs, is the student athletes begin filling out a 14-day pre-screener survey um, that they have to submit to their athletic trainer daily. If they miss a day, it ends up turning into a 15, 16, 17-day process. So if you ever uh, have dealt with 18 to 22 year olds and trying to remind them to complete something um, that's paperwork related, it's special. Um, but this is one thing that they never miss the ball on and working with my student athletes that I'm responsible for, I didn't have to remind them once and they were right on top of it. Um, at the end of that 14 day period, they then report to the University Health Services for um, swab testing. They have a PCR test, nasal swab, and serology by blood draw. Um, Assuming that both of those are negative, they then shelter in place for 48 hours. Once they're negative, they then are cleared to undergo their um, preseason physical, which is what we've done annually anyway. It's a 30 page questionnaire that they fill out, give us their full health history, especially for the incoming freshmen. We try and go in depth with them. Um, the athletic trainers have been working from home whenever possible, of course, but um, for those student athletes, we do follow up phone calls, virtual visits to make sure we have a comprehensive health history, not only capturing those 14 days, but honestly, how has your athletic activity changed since March 10th or 12th or whenever things shut down for them? Um, we understand we're facing a unique situation, not only because we usually work with deconditioned athletes, especially when I have a fall sport, things get a little deconditioned over the summer when they're trying to enjoy their summer and having a fun time and ramping up that activity needs to happen in a well-controlled way, especially in the heat. But now we're dealing with things that have kind of been shut down longer than the normal period of time. Um, so not only do they go through their pre-participation physical, meet with the physician if there's anything necessarily uh, wrong. Freshmen are required to meet with the physician at the start of their career anyway. Once they get through that point, we then collaborate with our strength conditioning staff to identify what is an appropriate um, fitness progression or fitness return over a 48 to 72 hour period um, that's specific to that sport. So we're not gonna put a golfer through the same thing that a swimmer would go through or a cheerleader, you know, the same thing that a field hockey player would go through. We're identifying um, tests and uh, protocols that are specific to the level of endurance or skill level for that particular sport. Um, and once they successfully get through that uh, 48 to 72 hour period with strength conditioning, they're then cleared to resume activity. Now what activity is right now with things being relatively shut down has been interesting. Um, our weight rooms are available to the student athletes, but only in groups of 10 and only for those who have gone through this process. So. In my case, in particular, working with field hockey, we have about six or seven student athletes who are international who can't come back to campus yet. Um, they're also trying to find ways to work around State Department visa applications and getting appointments for those things. In addition to kind of just understanding, you know, if I do get back because I have dual citizenship and I'm allowed to come back to the United States because I traveled internationally, I still have to quarantine somewhere for 14 days in one country and 14 days in another country. So. Um, it's been very, very interesting working through that process um, and educating them, obviously, on why things are important. Um, but once they understand, like, hey, this is whether or not or determine upon whether or not we have a season, they're on board. Um, no one wants to, and we've had to explain to them, no one wants anyone to deal with this, but we also don't want you to have to face something where because you are a superhuman elite athlete, you're probably going to be asymptomatic if this is something that happens to you. And you're going to be really frustrated because you're going to be sitting still and under, not un, really understanding why. And then your re recovery after the fact is going to look like the same kind of timeline as a mono. It's not going to be 10 to 14 days and, oh, I'm asymptomatic and I'm just going to go back. Um, I was going to say one thing that I could share after this, um, if uh, Mike wants to distribute it, is an article by Dr. Chung from Michigan Cardiology um, that he wrote about the cardiac implications with athletes and what we need to be aware of when people do return to elite level fitness. Um, some things to kind of pay attention to and what we're using with the 
obviously the negative PCR tests and the serology that happens, varying levels of serology. And I'm sure Kristen and Ryan could probably speak to that a little bit more um, as to kind of what that looked like. But the information that we're gleaning from that is understanding that people who are positive on a serology test do need extra cardiac workups before they're cleared for activity. Um, so that's kind of the basic protocol as it stands right now in a nutshell. Um, and then once they're cleared for facility access, every student athlete and staff member and coach is required to fill out a um, questionnaire on their phone daily and report to one of the stations in athletic campus for a temperature check. After that is completed, their M card then provides them access to the buildings that they need to get to. Otherwise, we're completely locked out. Yeah, very, very in-depth and intensive protocol. I think, you know, certainly U of M with the resources has the ability to do something like that. But I do think for those of you who are watching that are considering, you know, high school athletics and, and things of that nature, it seems like heavy emphasis on pre-screening is very important. And I think you know, bringing up the fact that athletes are coming back very deconditioned right now is, is critically important. I mean, weight rooms haven't been open, athletes have been sitting in their houses. And I think ensuring that they're brought back into a progression appropriately is a critical aspect of this that is not really thought of because we're so concerned about talking about the virus and preventing its spread, which is critically important. We're not thinking about all the overuse injuries and things like that can, that can occur from just being deconditioned during this period. And I think that that's a great point. And Claire, you also brought up, and I'd love for you to share that article uh, from Dr. Chung. It seems like, and again, not, a, not an epidemiologist, but from what I've read, there is a strong vascular component to this. And I think the cardiovascular element, that information would be good to get out there. David, let's let's switch gears here. Let's talk about the the fitness center setting. I mean, you're in a you're in a big medical fitness center there in, in Indiana at Hancock Health. Obviously, a little bit less controlled of an environment than what Claire would get. What are you guys doing to pre-screen and work based upon the recommendations that you're getting from state and federal officials? Sure. So yeah, we, uh, you know, back in April and May started making our plans and we made a, a phased approach to reopening um, with the guidance of others within the Medical Fitness Association, um, our medical director here at our centers. And, and so the, the four things that we really focused on uh, from the start were one, screening people as they came in the door, both our employees and our members. Um, and patients that come in. So we do a temperature check. Um, we ask about uh, COVID-19 symptoms. Um, if, if anyone's been in contact with somebody with a positive uh, case and, and if, them, if they themselves have been positive. So the 14 day recommended period um, for that. So, so first of all, just making sure that everybody, every time they come in the doors uh, are screened. Um, then we are requiring our staff to wear masks and we are strongly encouraging our members to wear masks. Um, there's, there's only so much of a desire to, to mandate that. Um, and we struggled with that a little bit, um, but we ended up going with just a, a strong recommendation. Um, we, of course, have the physical distancing. I don't like the social um, distancing term. I go with physical. Um, so we, we, we have a minimum of six feet. And, and in our first phase, we did several things to um, even go above that. So, uh, for example, in our group exercise classes, we created 14 by 14 uh, grid squares. So that's, that's essentially 200 square feet um, per person. Uh, so much more than the, than the six feet distancing. Um, and, and that has been met. That's one of the things I think that has been met with, with some of the best um, response from a state safety perspective of our members feeling comfortable. Um, and then lastly, we're mandating um, the wipe down of our equipment with a hospital grade uh, disinfectant. Um, so, so those four things have been really uh, what we've keyed in on. We've, we've, we've done a lot of other uh, phased in approaches where, where some services have not been available from the start. We opened on May 26th and Indiana is now in what they're calling uh, stage 4.5. Uh, we were supposed to head into our final uh, stage five last weekend, but, but we delayed because we saw a little bit of a spike in the, in the state. 
um, in cases. So uh, we're, we're holding in a, a little holding pattern, but um, we're, we're now in the, in the point where we're opening back more and more services. Um, and, and fortunately so far, uh, the, the feedback from our members is that they're feel, feeling very safe. Uh, we started our first week back, we were at about 58% of our normal utilization. And just last week, we were up to 72%. So uh, we're slowly starting to increase our utilization. People are feeling, I think, safe and comfortable with uh, some of the precautions we're putting in place. Great. What are you seeing? I mean, being open now for you know, over, over a month, going on six weeks, you, you talked about the masks. What are you seeing in terms of people's willingness to actually wear the mask when they're exercising? And is that, is that stratified by age to some degree? What's, what's been your observation? So I would say that I see more seniors wearing masks. Um, being a medical fitness center, we have a, a high volume of seniors. Um, I would say the folks who start to do intense, vigorous exercise uh, tend to not wear a mask uh, because of the, the comfort in wearing it. Um, although that's probably where respiration is greater and is needed more. <laughs> so, um, but you know, in, since we haven't mandated it, I think I see, you know, some of the, when, when somebody's running on a treadmill, if somebody's uh, taking a high intensity class, uh, those sorts of things. Obviously, if they're in the pool, they're not wearing it. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I would say maybe close to half of our, our members are wearing them each day. Um, varies day to day, varies time of day, I think. I think the younger crowd is, uh, feels a little bit more, um, comfortable not wearing them. So uh, I think that's what I'm seeing. Yeah. And you also mentioned that you have certain parts of your club that have reopened and other parts that haven't. What, what have you held back on at this point? So uh, now we're in our, our final stage at our center. So we, we really have um, most everything open. We, we initially did not open our kids care area. Um, when we did open it in our last phase, it was at a very limited number um, with reservations required, things like that. Um, we, we had a, like I mentioned before, the, the uh, 14 by 14 spaces in our group exercise. We also applied 200 square feet per member uh, to all of the other spaces on our building. So it had a kind of a maximum capacity for each room. Um, so we, uh, we didn't have contact sports like basketball going on. Uh, that wasn't something that we were allowing initially. Um, but now really uh, we've slowly reintroduced them. Uh, some of them with the, with still with uh, restrictions on capacity and uh, having reservations to do that for all of our classes. Classes don't get too big. Um, some of the uh, some of our clinical fitness programs just opened. So, uh, for example, we do a uh, rock steady boxing for Parkinson disease, um, and that just reopened um, this week actually. And so, um, we're seeing people slowly come back into some of our clinical fitness programs, and those we we held off initially, um, but now are 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 reintroducing those. Yeah, that's great. And I think maybe the best and most important takeaway there is you very much phased your reopening uh, very similarly to what our states are facing reopening is you went with lowest risk things first and then you progressed to high risk things, which obviously your your clinical population is going to be the, the highest risk that you're working with. That's great. And uh, the MFA does have some really robust guidelines that we'll make sure we share after the fact. I know as a, as a fitness facility owner, I found those guidelines very instructive, right down to granular things, like you said, one person per every 200 square feet. It really gives you, I think, a good way to operationalize a lot of the things that we're hearing from the experts into a framework that you can actually implement. Corey, let's let's move into the PT clinic setting. This is this is actually an interesting setting because unlike Claire and David, who are kind of voluntary based exercise settings, PT is kind of a, a forced exercise setting to a certain degree. So there's 
obviously an added level of comfort that people need to feel to make sure they get their butts in there. What are you guys, what are you guys doing at MedSport in terms of the mitigation strategies? Yeah, thanks for the question, Mike, and uh, thanks uh, for having me on the panel tonight. Um, I, you know, I think one of the biggest things we've done at Michigan Medicine and at MedSport is uh, the pre-screening for all of our patients. Um, and, you know, fortunately, being part of a big health system, we're able to, uh, you know, have some of the resources to make calls to patients in advance, uh, do some of the sc screening questions. Uh, but we're also very similarly to David, um, screening patients at the door. Uh, similar uh, COVID screening questions, as well as taking temperatures. Uh, patients are required to wear masks in our facilities currently, uh, as well as our staff are wearing masks. So we're trying to, again, stack some of the preventative measures on top of each other to reduce exposure. Um, certain patients who may be high, higher risk are being offered um, virtual care. So uh, uh, really any patient at this point who is uncomfortable with attending therapy will be offered virtual uh, care visits um, and or if they're at a higher risk, we'll offer that first prior to bringing them for in-person care. Um, and as you said, sometimes just the uh, nature of their um, orthopedic recovery requires them to be in person. Uh, certainly we can better isolate uh, in some of our facilities uh, for uh, privatized care rather than needing to be um, in a large open gym at times too. So, uh, so we have a variety of strategies uh, with those mitigations of um, COVID. Uh, physical distancing, again, is huge. I think this, is, this applies all the way down to the athletics department in Michigan to uh, you know, fitness centers around the country and PT clinics. Um, certainly, if we're doing it right, we should be um, phys physical spacing ourselves from our uh, patients and or clients when possible. Uh, but in the PT world, at times, we have to get our hands on people and um, again, we need to use the proper PPE uh, and coach and guide our patients appropriately of, you know, why we need to invade their bubble, so to speak, uh, to get our job done. So, Yeah, I'm curious with regard to particularly the manual therapy that you're performing. I mean, obviously, you're wearing masks. Um, are you wearing gloves at this point when you have to do manual therapy? What's, what, what is the PPE in addition to masks that you may be using, if anything? Yeah, great question. Um, always hand hygiene first. Um, gloving up is uh, preferred, uh, and then hand hygiene after. Um, you know, there are ways to create barriers with uh, towels and pillows and other things between a patient and a provider, um, but certainly with uh, a lot of hands-on skin, soft tissue work, those type of things, you definitely need gloves and uh, um, the appropriate PPE. What are you guys seeing in terms of return to the clinic at this point? I mean, you know, David said that you know, he's at 72% of their, their normal utilization, which man, I'm like, my fingers are crossed for that when, when we reopen. What are you guys seeing if you have access to those metrics? Right, um, so currently we're operating somewhere between 40 to 50% of our normal volume. And part of that was uh, an additional mitigation strategy to not, um, overpopulate our space. Um, and uh, it has been something that's been very successful. There is a demand out there for PT services and, and we're certainly ramping up. Uh, we have the potential to, I think, get back to about 80 or 90% of our past volumes. Mm -hmm. um, but we're doing this in a phased kind of strategy over time. Um, so kind of week to week, month to month, we're reassessing. Uh, along with that, uh, because uh, therapy has uh, a large demand. We're also extending hours uh, for our clinics uh, to try to appropriately space people. Um, and so that is creating challenges, of course, for, for staff, but also uh, for patients that um, be seen at hours that they maybe aren't used to coming to a, a medical type appointment. Mm -hmm. So uh, certainly we'll, we'll hope to get back close to a hundred percent level, but um, we also just need to be aware of the realities of that physical space. Yeah, and, and I know that there's a good amount of still virtual PT that's going on. For those of you that weren't with us during the first webinar, we had Val McPherson from MedSport to talk about the virtual space. And I mean, that's certainly a viable mechanism to, to be able to implement therapy with someone that's not willing to go in the clinic. 
Um, uh, Kristen or Ryan, um, and this may be more of a question for Kristen. We've heard David, Claire, and Corey talk about the pre-screenings that they're using and, you know, there's apps and there's sophisticated systems. And obviously David, Claire, and Corey have access to, you know, a lot of resources that maybe your standard, you know, smaller gym, fitness center, or PT clinic may not have access to. Can one of you two speak to how to maybe distill down some of these pre-screening strategies into something that doesn't require as much robust technology. Like, you know, what do you what are you guys seeing out there? And Kristen, I feel like your role with the health department, you might be better suited to to answer the less sophisticated way to do this. Yeah, I mean, so um, we've created a bunch of templates. So if you want to go to the Washington County Health Department's website, um, we have templates created that are paper based. So if you want to go real like low tech. Uh, but there are a ton of apps and other things. And it's just really quick symptom screening. Again, it's just a check-in. Um, you know, we are a culture that often tries to muster through illness to um, do what we need to do and go to work and, and kind of live our daily lives. Uh, this uh, this pandemic is teaching us like, hey, no, you really need to, to check in. And if you're not feeling well, get it checked out. Um, so again, it's it's really pretty simple stuff. So looking for things like fever, cough, sore throat, um, there's a ton of other symptoms that may be associated with COVID. Uh, it's a, it's a, it can be a pretty lengthy list. Um, what we're recommending is, again, temperature screening. A lot of times it's something simple like one of those forehead thermometers. So um, instead of using like an oral thermometer, uh, this way you've got a little bit of a lower touch uh, screen and it's something easy that uh, I think is a little bit more available now. I know early on in the pandemic, it was very, very difficult to come by, um, but those are pretty, pretty simple tools that you can use. Yeah, and I think that the take-home message there really is that you don't need the resources of University of Michigan or of Hancock Health to be able to appropriately pre-screen and temperature check. Uh, this stuff is is pretty widely available, and I'm sure for those of you that are watching, your local health departments, much like Washtenaw County, likely have this information, and it seems like there's a whole host of free apps and things like that right now that you can use. I know the state of Michigan has a a COVID tracker, I believe, through their website. So you don't necessarily need the robust resources of a big health system or a university to be able to, to do this properly. Uh, I think one thing that's important to point out is ideally, everyone would ask themselves these questions prior to stepping foot in the door of one of these facilities. In, in an ideal world, you've asked yourself those questions at home. And if you answer yes to your Kristen and Ryan's points earlier, you, you've stayed home. Uh, David, a question for you that I think is a, is a good one. Uh, Lisa asks, you mentioned the 14 by 14 spaces that you're doing in Group X, and which, I mean, that's amazing. Um, and, you know, presuming you've moved equipment around in the facility to provide, you know, additional space, um, how, how have you manipulated the, the physical equipment in your building to ensure for that distancing? Yeah, great question because um, <clears throat> we've had to do some different things in, in each of our facilities. We have three, fortunately, they're large uh, medically integrated fitness centers. Um, so, so I think this probably is more of a challenge for a smaller facility, but um, we have enough cardio equipment that if we shut down every other one, um, we still have plenty for the volumes that we're seeing. So that's what we did uh, on cardio, just to really make sure that that six feet minimum uh, was maintained in, in each scenario for, for cardio equipment. Most of our strength machines were already at that, that distance or greater. Um, so we didn't really have to do much. There were a few uh, situations where we had to pull one off, you know, out of where it was and into maybe a hallway or, or some other uh, location. Um, but I saw, I saw that question. The other part was uh, soft porous yeah. equipment. And, um, and that was, that was something that, that came up in our planning session. And we just decided it's too hard to clean things, you know, foam rollers, uh, the foam uh, handle grips on, on some tubes and, and, and things like that. Uh, the variety of, of those things that really were, were tougher to make sure that we were really getting it, it cleaned well, because um, I think cleaning is, is the top thing that people want to see happen. If, if they come in and they're not seeing people, uh, both our staff and other members clean, 
um, it's almost like it's this new social expectation uh, when somebody's in a gym that um, if you see somebody that's not wiping down an equipment after you're done, you, you almost have the right to say something uh, to them, just, you know, make sure that things are getting clean. But there are a lot of uh, types of uh, equipment that we have that just really would be difficult. So we made the decision early on to just remove those things. Uh, there'd be other ways to do those exercises, and um, but certainly the the spacing of equipment is very important. Yeah, and I think that's pretty common. I mean, I know at my facility we removed exercise mats, and we just said, "Hey, you know, bring bring your own mat." It's just it's there are just certain things that you you can't clean effectively, and it's it's interesting. You mentioned the optics of somebody not cleaning and. I heard an analogy and I can't remember where I heard it, but essentially seeing somebody not clean something in the fitness center is analogous to watching somebody shoplift from a grocery store. It's just, it just is a deviant social norm at this point. Uh, but that actually segues really nicely into my next question. And, and David, I'll start with you since you just ended that. How are you educating your clients and your members about all of these protocols. I mean, certainly everyone's been inundated with so much stuff. How's the education getting out there to them about what they need to adhere to and how they need to behave when they're in their facility? Yeah, that, that is a challenge. Um, we've used every channel that's available to us. Uh, we've, we've produced some uh, videos and those, those tend to be pretty effective when, when people watch them. So we've posted those on our social media. Um, some of them have been where we video our staff going around from space to space, showing um, what's happening, what, how we're cleaning things, how we're expecting others to do things within our spaces. Um, we've, we've sent out multiple emails. Um, you know, we've, we've texted our members to tell them uh, some of those things. So we, we have some of those uh, technological um, platforms to be able to do that. We've also uh, put up signs and, and I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of signs. I don't think people read them generally, or at least the ones you want to read them aren't doing it as much as you'd want to, but um, we, we do. We post signs around, um, you know, kind of the, giving the expectation of, of, of you're supposed to clean equipment every time you get it on and off. Um, so I, I think, you know, you still get plenty of people saying, oh, I never saw your email. I never, I, I didn't know what you were doing. And, and that ends up being just some some face-to-face -face or over the phone conversations. And we've had people say, you know, call up and say, you know, I'm not sure if I want to come back right now. I'm not sure if I'm comfortable. What are you doing? And, and, and when we've had the opportunity to have those conversations, a lot of times people will say, well, um, that that all sounds really good. And I think I'm going to come in and try it. And, and more, more times than not, I think we've had people come in, see everything that we're doing and, and feel very comfortable about it. Um, so I think, you know, communication is always going to be one of the biggest challenges that we have. And, and we simply can't expect to get to 100% of people. But I think if we use as many channels of communication as possible um, and just repeat it, um, repeat it over and over, uh, that's going to increase our likelihood of, of getting the message through. Yeah, yeah, that's great. The communication de definitely presents a challenge with the, the members that utilize your facility. Claire, I can imagine on your end, uh, you know, the communication strategy to the group of 18 to 22 year olds that may think they're somewhat immune to this can be even more challenging. What are you guys doing in the athletic department to be able to provide that education? Um, it's, it's very interesting, yes, but I always remind our student athletes that you are a student athlete and the operative word is student, so you're going to learn something new. Um, that being said, as a part of their pre-participation physical, they always have an educational lecture every year that kind of goes over all of the services under the sports medicine umbrella and what's offered from student athlete and health and welfare from injury rehab all the way down to nutrition and everything in between. Um, so there has been a COVID piece added to that lecture this year. Um, so, you know, of course we always practice, you know, healthy hygiene and preach to them about, you know, the days of Michael Jordan playing with the flu are not attractive anymore. So we're not doing that. Um, don't go down that path because we don't want it to infect the whole team. Um, so in addition to um, preaching a culture of completion with the surveys and everything that needs to be done, we've also worked really hard to change their mindset. So they understand, you know, 
Claire doesn't feel great when she has to take a day off or hasn't felt great when she has to take a day off because of a runny nose. And I admit in the past, I've found a way to come into work. That's not going to be the norm anymore. You know, and I think we've all kind of been there, especially when, you know, we love what we do and we're really passionate about it. Um, but not only for the student athlete education, but also um, our staff has taken the time to do the contract tracing course through Johns Hopkins that was offered on Coursera. So not only are we armed with the knowledge of how to prevent everything, but then we can say, say, hey, you know, here's what it looks like for somebody else who may or may not be contacted by the health department who's not in the cocoon of athletics to make sure you have this information at your fingertips. Here's what we know. And so armoring ourselves with that knowledge, in addition to the fact that, you know, heaven forbid something happens with fall sports this fall, we have another opportunity to redeploy and make ourselves useful to the community. Um, we've armored ourselves with that knowledge as well. And um, in terms of the student athletes understanding that, that has helped change their mindset to understand that the, the culture is going to be different. Seems like in both David and Claire's case, very much a, an emphasis on getting out in front of this and trying to you know, communicate through multiple mediums. Corey, in the in the PT setting, what is what what are you guys doing at MedSport to inform your your patients about their behaviors? Yeah, so it really does start um, in a variety of ways, and I think uh, David hit on this. You know, as far as communication goes. Uh, you know, from a hospital, like 30,000 view perspective, like we're educating patients with marketing and calls and the website and um, then the providers, uh, you know, the physicians, the therapists, uh, even our rehab techs, uh, you know, we're all uh, wandering around the clinic um, and reminding people about hand hygiene, as well as, uh, you know, giving that, you um, uh, physical example of, of cleaning everything as we touch it um, and reminding each other. Uh, and uh, it really just starts with a change in culture. Um, you know, it's kind of speak up for safety. If you see something, say something. And, you know, we expect that of our staff. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not afraid to uh, take uh, a cross checking of, hey, Corey, I, I didn't see you use that hand sanitizer. Oh, thanks for saying something. I, I'm on it right now, you know. And, and so, um, you've got to be willing to, to be checked and, and also to check other people. So, um, you know, if you're doing it in a, with a smile and uh, in a non-threatening way, and a, uh, I think it goes over well for patients. Um, I think long-term too, you know, we know this virus and, and Kristen and Ryan could coach us better on this. It's, it's not going away soon. Um, and, and there's a lot more to learn. So, uh, you know, I think, we need to be expected as professionals to continually educate, uh, even though for us, it may sound like a broken record. Um, we just have to uh, fight that fight. Yeah. yeah. I think what you said about a culture of accountability around actually adhering to the protocols that you're educating your patients, your athletes, and your members on is so important. I think there's nothing that will really degrade the trust between our profession and the people we serve than saying one thing through all these communications and then that not being visibly done when people <clears throat> come into our facilities. And I think that that's, that's such a critical thing. Uh, Kristen, I'm going to, and Ryan, I'm going to kind of bridge a question to both of you guys uh, by way of something that came via the Q and a from Claire uh, and you guys can see it, but you know, she asked, all right, we're talking about how we keep the, the members and the patients safe here, but what about, you know, Claire and, and Corey that are in these clinics and, and we're in these settings and we're working hands on with people. What, what can we do best to keep our staff and our team safe during this period of time? I don't know which one of you wants to chime in on that first. I guess I'll go ahead. Uh, I don't think it's that much different from how we keep everybody else safe. So, you know, we, we come, we um, design spaces that can protect them like putting up a plexiglass shield in places where they'll be in contact with people or, you know, we make sure that people know the appropriate distance to stand back from the counter and things like that, right? I mean, those are all things <clears throat> that we can do that everybody is doing just to ensure physical space, physical distancing, masks, hand hygiene, all those things. It's not really any different for a staff person. It's just that they come into contact with more more people than sort of the, the person who's there for an hour because they're there for, you know, eight hours or more during the day. So, um, I, I don't know if Kristen has anything else to add, but I, I don't think it's that different from how we protect from everybody else. Yeah, I mean, Ryan, you're right on. You're using a lot of the same tools. Um, 
you know, thinking about the physical environment and making sure the employees have the information um, that they need to protect themselves as well. So making sure they're comfortable with their work environment. So uh, for example, in my office, we had plexiglass shields put up at our front counter and people were standing between the shields instead of at them. So we had to make some modifications and we had to respond really quickly. Um, and so we did that and that really helped uh, the staff help feel more protected uh, in their work environment. I think the other piece was uh, related to testing and certainly um, we hope that there will be continued testing for COVID. Um, you know, it took a while to get that ramped up. It is ramped up now. There's a lot of different testing locations and there's a broad recommendation. If you're leaving your home to work, you should probably get tested routinely, especially if you're coming in contact with a lot of people. Um, and so, you know, finding those testing centers, uh, you can check your local health department or your state. A lot of times there's websites to find, uh, you know, local clinics that are near you that are convenient um, and just get in the habit of doing that because while you're doing like the antibody tests or the screening test, um, typically the screening tests are only a point in time. They're not to say that you're now protected. Um, and even the serology tests, we don't have a lot of great data on exactly what that means. Um, so, you know, again, just routine testing and then giving, again, a meeting with the employees regularly, checking in, how are things going? What modifications do we need to make? What pinch points might there be um, in our operation? You know, what are you noticing the clients are or are not doing? Again, just checking in with them and making sure they've got what they need. When you say routinely tested, what, is there a, a general best practice that you could suggest? I think the document I saw was about once every two weeks. Okay. And right. again, it's just a broad guideline. And those change. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one thing I think, you know, I hope goes without saying at this point is that we're learning more and more every day and that's the nature of how science evolves. And certainly some of the things that we're doing right now might prove to be incredibly effective and other things that we're doing right now might be you know, wholly ineffective by the time this whole thing is over. Um, I want to speak to the person that's listening right now that is kind of ambivalent about going back to a PT clinic or a gym or a fitness center. And I think we'll start with the, the epidemiological experts and then we'll kick it over to everyone else as kind of our, our last question to answer here. What factors should individuals be weighing in terms of making the decision to come back to indoor exercise or to a physical therapy clinic, or for that matter, to the parent that's trying to talk with their high school athlete about if they should re-engage in sports? What are the factors that people should weigh? So I, I think everyone's going to have to think about the benefits of the activity versus the risks of, of coronavirus, right? So um, I'll give a little bit of a personal example. Um, I'm a leukemia survivor. I had a bone marrow transplant in 2019. So I am a high risk patient. Um, I would most likely develop severe disease if I was infected. My risk calculation is going to be much different from, um, you know, most other people that are 35 years old. And so everyone has going to have to take that into consideration, but also think about um, <clears throat> the benefits of, of physical activity. We know that, um, you know, improving your physical health can help the, the way that you respond to this virus, it, you know, boost your immune, immune system. Um, certainly getting in better shape is going to help your, if you, you know, being able to, to breathe easier on a general basis is going to help. Uh, um, if you have, you know, tr trouble breathing due to the virus, things like that. Um, the social interactions, the mental health, right? Those are all going to be important benefits of these activities. And you're just going to have to weigh them against the risks for yourself and those of your close contacts. So your family, your friends, you, you know, your elderly relatives. Kristen? Yeah, I think exactly what Ryan said. You really need to kind of do a, a cost benefit analysis or risk, I guess, benefit analysis to see what are those risks? What are you willing to take? And, and again, not just for yourself, but again, those close contacts, right? Who are the people that you um, may unwittingly expose and, and think through some of those things? Um, COVID is here to stay. Uh, so again, I think this is just kind of our, our new way of thinking of things. Um, but there certainly are a lot of benefits to exercise as well. So just layering those different pieces together and seeing what the best fit is. Um, can help you make that decision. And then thinking about the, the type of physical activity you're doing and where you're doing that physical activity can also make a difference, right? Are you going to a small cramped space? Are you doing it outside? I mean, again, there's a lot of different options in terms of physical activity. It doesn't have to always be um, one particular thing or what you would normally do. Be creative, 
do lots of different things. One of the um, benefits, I think, of this pandemic has been that there's been a lot of different creative ways for people to um, do physical activity through Zoom meetups and classes and outdoor activities. Um, and so embracing some of those different options as well can also provide some benefits uh, with minimizing risk. Yeah, I think that's such an important point. I mean, certainly in gym based exercise has a whole host of benefits, both socially and physically, but there are a bunch of different mechanisms to do those now. And to the credit of you know, the physical therapy industry, the strength and conditioning industry and the commercial fitness industry, we've, we've figured out a way to pivot into a virtual space relatively quickly and provide some high quality service. Um, Claire, David, Corey, anything to add as to what people should consider? I mean, Corey, I'm particularly interested, you know, given the nature of your setting, what those risk benefit analyses look like for your patients? Yeah, I think it's um, shifted um, from a clinician standpoint, our thought process on how we want to triage, for lack of a better term, uh, some of our patients. Um, and certainly those who have had a recent acute injury or surgery, uh, we are more aggressively treating early on to see if we can um, more quickly get them out of our facility so that they can do some virtual rehab or distant rehab or, or a home program or transition to a medical fitness uh, facility. Um, so, you know, there, there's different strategies for how we can manage uh, um, some of our cases. And, and again, I do think it is a little bit of a, a risk analysis for the patient, but, um, you know, we would encourage people not to avoid healthcare when they need it. Uh, so, you know, if it's a simple ankle sprain, uh, that can turn into something else down the road if not appropriately diagnosed and triaged and, and that type of thing. So, uh, you know, we certainly want folks to utilize our services, um, but we are willing to be creative and um, willing to try to utilize some of these new resources we have with virtual care to um, appropriately um, treat patients in multiple manners. Awesome. awesome. Claire, David, are you well, I like, I like everything that was discussed, I guess, um, in the collegiate athletic setting and even thinking about a college campus, it's always unique because, you know, you, sometimes you have five, seven people smushed in a house. Mm -hmm. So um, parents probably need to speak with their um, young students about what kind of conversations are happening with those roommates. Um, do you have a roommate that hasn't really cleaned anything in a long time? And we need to have a whole new conversation about that. Um, at least in athletics, we've also considered, you know, there may or may not be a house full of um, seven student athletes, three of whom are on one team, three of whom are on another. And then there's one lone person that's not a student athlete. Does that one non-student athlete have the same information or access to the same resources? Probably not. Um, so you probably have to look at things globally from a university level on down. What is the university doing um, from a campus perspective in terms of, you know, what Michigan's doing right now, hybrid classes, smaller classrooms only, we're not doing 500 person lecture halls, are there temperature checks at certain buildings and things like that. Um, and just making sure that there's, you know, like we've discussed a, a warm culture around, hey, make sure you Purell in and Purell out and not um, getting your feathers ruffled about it. David, anything to add from your end? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, that's all spot on. I think what, what has just been said about this, what I would add is that um, people should consider the, the place that they're going. So, uh, for example, um, there's, there's, I think there's just a, uh, a desire to get back to normal and, and before COVID and, and, you know, so there's, there might be some places that are, that are lifting restrictions. When we put our uh, plan together back in, in April, uh, part of it was based on the state's guidance that uh, in July, all restrictions would be removed. And a couple of weeks ago, we met with our medical director and, and some others, and, and we talked about it. And we decided that there were a lot of things that we were going to keep in really indefinitely. Um, and so I think, you know, as we, we got to be careful that, you know, we don't lift these restrictions too soon. There are a lot of things that, that we can keep on that, that aren't that uh, cumbersome for people and uh, still maintains the safety and cleanliness and, and so forth. Um, and so I think as, as people are coming back, they got to make sure where they're going. Uh, you know, I, whenever I go somewhere and they, they screen me before, I feel real comfortable. So, um, you know, I think 
we need to keep that going for quite a while. This, this isn't going to be a, you know, another month and, and we're out of the woods type of thing. We're, we're going to be in this for a while. So I think we got to make sure that um, our clinics, our facilities, um, whatever setting that we're in maintains at least a, a, a base, but, but if not even better um, than that, some of these, these guidelines that we've been talking about um, really for, for quite a while. And, and, and so if, if, if somebody's going in a place and, and they don't have a lot of that, they, they should, that should be a little bit of a red flag, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. I mean, now, now more than ever, I think it's just so important to, to do your homework and make sure that you do indeed feel comfortable. Well, this is certainly something I feel like we could probably spend another two or three hours on because the issue is so complex. But I mean, this information was incredibly helpful. You know, Kristen Ryan, David Clare, and Corey, thank you guys so much. Um, as far as everyone who is watching, uh, please don't forget that we're doing another panel on August 12th at 1 p.m. That's a Wednesday in the afternoon on working with the vulnerable populations, the elderly, the immunocompromised. Uh, that's certainly going to be a, a very interesting topic to talk about because those individuals definitely need to be served properly. There were, are a couple of questions that we saw in the Q&A we didn't have a chance to get to. I will make sure that those questions do end up getting answered. I'll either get them off to the appropriate individual or answer them myself. And please be looking for an email here in the next couple of days or so that will have the link to this on the School of Kinesiology's YouTube channel, some resources that we can provide uh, that the MFA has given us, as well as I think Claire is going to share that article and anything else we can get from our panelists will definitely pass along. I really want to thank everyone so much for joining us, all of our panelists. Thank you so much. Your expertise was greatly welcomed, and I hope everyone stays nice and healthy as they get back to their gyms, their physical therapy clinics, and their fitness centers. Have a great night.